Dan is our, as everybody well knows, was our uh, endovascular fellow uh, over the last uh, year. Um, and uh, uh, since we never saw him, we knew he was doing a great job. Um, uh, and uh, I, I can, I saw him a week or two ago and he was just positively glowing from all the radiation he's been exposed to. So um, uh, he's gonna talk to us about platelet inhibitors uh, as he, uh, um, uh, was preparing this talk, he felt like this would be kind of a, a better overview uh, and, and useful talk for him moving into the future. And uh, I, of course, I always encourage all the residents and fellows to give talks that they can use later on so they don't have to repeat their work more than once. So, Dan, uh, thank you very much. Please go ahead. No, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so initially we were going to talk about um, stroke uh, delivery and systems, but um, there's been a, a couple changes that we've been making to um, the platelet inhibitors that we're using. We've initiated a couple new protocols in endovascular. Um, and I thought it'd be a good time for a, a review. I've talked to Osmond, and David and uh, Jake and Bev um, and, and anyone else, please interrupt with questions or comments um, that you wish to add uh, during the talk or or later. So I don't have any relevant uh, conflict of interest. And when I was putting together this talk, um, I, I forget who was making me listen to Meatloaf um, in, in the Angio suite, but it, it sort of reminded me um, of how I feel about these platelet inhibitors because uh, as endovascular, we, we need them and we want them, but as a neurosurgeon, I, I really hate giving them um, because I hate doing open procedures on people. And, and unfortunately, um, We've seen too many people coming in at 2 a.m. on on aspirin and Plavix um, with hemorrhages. And some of the changes that we've made, uh, I, I think, are going to help remedy some of this um, and, and make it easier for us to, to treat uh, and also to limit the side effects of, of these. So if you guys recall, going all the way back to step one, um, Vessel, in, uh, vessel injury, if you have a hemorrhage or a foreign object, that triggers a, a cascade, which starts with primary hemostasis, um, which starts with vasoconstriction and formation of the platelet plug. And then as time goes on, that um, develops into a, a secondary hemostasis cascade with uh, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Um, what we typically see in endovascular uh, is, is part of this primary hemostasis, especially after we uh, drop stents, you see this fluffy um, platelet plug that's forming on the stents. And that's where a lot of our, our focus has been, uh, and certainly our focus with um, as we as we treat these uh, uh, potential complications um, as they form with, with platelet inhibitors. So just a quick review of uh, primary hemostasis and the platelet plug. Typically, you have normal endothelium in the vessels that are reducing um, prostacyclins and, and nitric oxide, uh, and that's inhibiting the platelet activation. When there's injury to the vessel wall, or also if you drop a stent, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this um, on the next slide, that triggers the initial activation of a couple platelets uh, as they come in contact with the collagen or with the um, metal stent those platelets undergo a conformational change and they then release ADP, um, thromboxane and a bunch of, of other uh, activating substances which then trigger a cascade. The surrounding platelets then have a conformational change. And on the right, I thought this was a really good picture of just how this happens. Um, so you can see the conformational change in the platelets. They now look like starfish on this image. Um, and the receptors that you see with the uh, arm sticking out and the, the red uh, attached, those are your G2B3A uh, uh, receptors binding to uh, fibrinogen. Uh, von Willenbrand factor also comes into play um, with cross-linking of these. And then, as you can see, the secondary uh, messengers are released and trigger the cascade of just building this 
block of platelets, which then can be further refined later with the um, secondary hemostasis cascade. So why do stent activate platelets? We already sort of discussed one way they do it um, with uh, sort of an inflammatory or a foreign object um, response, but there's there's other ways too. Um, and this goes into sort of the uh, part of the stent design. So we like people to be on aspirin and Plavix before we, we place stents um, because as we place them, uh, there can be some some injury to the uh, endothelial wall, uh, which will trigger platelets to um, start forming a plug in response to that injury. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the stent metal can trigger a response, uh, and that's sort of our primary focus. That's what we do uh, when we give antiplatelets to try to combat those those two processes. But also there's a, there's a third process um, which platelets get activated through just turbulent flow. Um, and as they flow over the stent walls, if they have a thick strut, it kind of creates this region where the platelets are being disrupted that can trigger them to uh, respond as if there was a trauma and to get activated. And this is why there's a lot of um, engineering that goes into the development of these stents. These are some of the critical pathways, which we'll be highlighting. The first one, thromboxane inhibitors, um, will be will be talked about in a second. The P2Y12 inhibitors will also be a, a big focus. Um, the GP2B3A receptors uh, are sort of can be thought of the the readout of this and the the ultimate um, outcome of activating platelets. PDE inhibitors, I've used these once, not here. Um, but I'll, I'll go over one of these uh, and how it can be used in patients who are allergic to um, Plavix. And then this PPAR1, um, I won't go over it, but this was a really interesting drug. The half-life of Vorapaxar was something like 15 days. Um, so, I, you know, we, we don't usually use this. Um, and there was a lot of concern with, with using this, but, Targeting these um, PAR receptors is part of the future of what's developing in the, the antiplatelet field. So first of all, um, aspirin. As you guys remember, it's, it's an irreversible inhibitor of the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. The COX-1 enzyme um, is the one that's within platelets and it reduces the thrombic, thromboxane to release um, and inhibiting the, the, the neighboring platelets from inducing this, this cascade. Over on the right, you can see um, how it does this. It, it actually activates or, or works on the, the active site and covalently modifies it such that it is a permanent inhibitor of this. It's, it doesn't get reversed. It's there for the life of the platelets. Um, I, this was very important to me and, and something I learned, non enteric coated aspirin, um, if you just take it orally, activates in a little less than an hour. Enteric coated takes three to four hours. Chewing non enteric coated uh, is within three to 20 minutes. It's almost immediate. And oftentimes when we're doing um, cases, if, if someone hasn't gotten aspirin, we'll give them a rectal aspirin, and that takes about 20 to 30 minutes. So it's it's comparable to being able to uh, chew non enteric coated. That being said, the, the chewing of non enteric coated is, is definitely the fastest delivery mechanism. And as I said, it's duration activity, it's irreversible. So 10% of platelets turn over daily, platelets last somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 10 days. Um, so once you, once you give aspirin every day, 10% of the platelets are, are replenished. So your uh, inhibition of platelets goes up. Um, but if you're thinking of operating on something and don't want any kind of chance of, of, a, of a bleeding issue, it's, it's greater than 10 days. Moving on to the P2Y12 inhibitors, uh, Plavix is the one that we use the most. It's sort of the first line. Um, 
and it's an irreversible inhibitor. So um, you can see over on the on the right, uh, it actually it, it attaches to the active site and inhibits any um, activation of uh, the P2Y12 uh, receptor. Onset of activity, it, it's about two hours after taking it reaches an adequate level of inhibition, but um, this is is dose dependent. Um, so a, a loading dose of 900 milligrams results in the same level of platelet inhibition after two hours as a loading dose of 300 after six hours. Um, duration of activity, the half-life of Plavix is about six hours, um, but with regards to uh, the, the activity it has on the platelets, it's irreversible. So uh, once again, it's it's this 10% of platelets turnover daily uh, and, and the effect lasts about 10 days. The half-life that you see about six hours, that's not super long, but reasonably long. And that's why when people take Plavix, um, if you were to give them platelets right afterwards, it, it would just immediately inactivate it uh, once again. And then the way that this is, um, metabolized also the there's active metabolites so the problem with plavix is not everyone's a responder and this is partly because plavix is a pro drug so in about 15 percent of caucasian 17 percent of african americans and 30 percent of people of asian descent have this genetic polymorphism in one of the enzymes within the liver, the P450 system, which metabolizes all the drugs. It's a 2C19, which makes them a, a poor responder. And in addition to that, there's some variability that comes from intestinal absorption of Plavix, uh, which is the way it's dosed. Um, so in order to effectively use Plavix, we need to test the patient and see if they're a responder. Uh, I, I, on the right, I thought this was really interesting that less than 15% of Plavix that we give actually goes on to um, become the, the active metabolite. The majority of it is um, modified and, and removed um, from the circulation without actually acting on platelets. Plavix also, <coughs> excuse me, because it goes through the P450 enzyme uh, system, as many of these do, um, there is some concern that Nexium or Prilosec um, could impact Plavix. So one could consider if, if people are on um, Nexium or, or Prilosec that you could start them on Protonix or an H2 blocker. Um, although this, this interaction is, is a little bit debated in how much impact that has. In, as, as I go through these P2Y12 inhibitors, um, you'll notice that they're always sort of compared to Plavix because Plavix is is really the, the gold standard that most people use. So here at UW, when we have someone who's resistant to uh, the effects of Plavix, the typical drug we reach for is Prasagrel or Effiant. Once again, it's an irreversible inhibitor. Onset of action is about 30 minutes, so it's slightly quicker. Um, once again, it's irreversible, so the same, same things apply um, for how long the, the effects last. And similar to Plavix, interestingly, Prasagrel is a prodrug, which is metabolized by those enzymes, but it's a different set of P450 enzymes. So it doesn't have the prevalence of non-responders that Plavix has. And as we go through the, the literature here, um, for all these P2Y12 inhibitors, it's always cardiac literature. Um, they've been doing this longer and they actually have a bigger footprint uh, in the in the P2Y12 or in the general platelet inhibitor um, literature, so it's it's always an a um, output of myocardial infarction and then looking at um, bleeding. If we if we would do this, I think we would probably look at strokes purely and not MIs. But um, we can extrapolate hopefully a little bit from from this literature. So as I mentioned, Prasgrel has a faster onset. Um, it's effective in nearly everyone. It doesn't need the same level of testing that Plavix needs. In a head-to-head -head double-blind study, Prasco reduced MI um, and target vessel revascularization compared to uh, Plavix, and it had less instant thrombosis. Major bleeding was observed in 2.4% of patients receiving Prasco and 1.8% receiving Plavix.
And one of the things about this literature um, is every time we see this, and you'll see this again and again, basically all of these drugs are more effective at doing what they do, but they have slightly more bleeding. But they never control for whether or not Plavix is actually working. Um, so in my mind, when I look at this, it, it makes me wonder if we're really getting a true look at how Plavix and Prasagril as drugs work, or if this is a readout of the response of the body to giving these drugs, um, which I think is probably more accurate and it may be more relevant. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind that it's not necessarily that this causes more bleeding. It just may be more effective. And if we're targeting all of the patients who are responders to Plavix, they may have similar bleeding rates um, with regards to this. So it's not as though Prasugril is, is more dangerous. One of the ones that, one of the P2Y12 inhibitors that I used at Dartmouth, this was sort of our first line go-to was Berlenta. Um, this is a reversible P2Y12 inhibitor. If you dig back to like high school chemistry, it's an allosteric inhibitor. So it doesn't bind to the active site. It binds somewhere else on the enzyme and changes the active site so that it, it can't, uh, there's no binding of ADP. Um, I didn't know about this before preparing this talk, but there, there's actually late uh, phase three clinical trials are complete for a monoclonal antibody to reverse the Kegrelor. And it's probably gonna be a, approved uh, this year such that if you gave to Kegelor and then saw a hemorrhage uh, and viewed that reversing it was, was absolutely needed, you could do that and it would work very effectively um, instead of having to, to wait it out. Onset of activities about 30 minutes um, after taking, you're at about 40% of max efficiency peaks around two hours. Um, duration of activity, the half-life, of ticagrelor, and again, this is the important thing because this is reversible. So if this falls off, you have no more platelet inhibition, is about eight to 12 hours. One of the benefits of Berlenta is it's not a prodrug, so no hepatic activation is needed. Uh, it's metabolized by the P450 enzymes, like most drugs are, so, so things like grapefruit juice and ketoconazole can impact its activity. Um, this is a really important point with Ticagrelor. The PLATO study, which is what I've referenced over on the right, um, when they looked at subgroup analysis and seeing which patients did not receive a benefit from Ticagrelor compared to Plavix, they found that patients taking more than 100 milligrams of aspirin daily, not as a loading dose, you can still load, the, the loading dose or the, the maintenance dose daily had less benefit from Ticagrelor. And uh, this is thought to maybe be because, as I mentioned, aspirin can hit two different enzymes. It may be through the second enzyme that it hits that uh, is limiting some of the, the benefits of Ticagrelor. When you compare it to the uh, to Plavix in the cardiac literature, Ticagrelor, has a slightly faster onset. It's not a pro drug. It is reversible uh, very soon. And a head to head double blind study um, reduced death from vascular MI stroke, um, reduced myocardial infarction, reduced deaths from vascular causes. Um, there was no change in the stroke rate. Um, there was no difference in overall major bleeding, which was defined as, uh, I think, five point drop in hemoglobin. Uh, or an intracranial hemorrhage. However, there were um, more intracranial hemorrhages with Ticagrelor that wasn't statistically significant, but it was noted. Um, but once again, they didn't account for whether or not the, the patients were responders to Plavix. So this simply could be looking at how the body's responding to these two drugs. This is... Um, another P2Y12 inhibitor that um, Jake is very excited about uh, and has been pushing us to use it. I think it has a, a real potential. Um, 
Kangrelor. Uh, it's a reversible inhibitor of P2Y12. Um, it's similar to Tecagrelor in that it doesn't bind to the AD, same place that ADP binds, um, but it's actually not known where it binds. It probably is similar to, to what Tecagrelor does, and it's an IV infusion. So the onset of activity is actually two to three minutes after the infusion started. And the duration of activity, um, when you stop it, its half-life is uh, between two and six minutes, um, which is, is very, very, very fast on and off. Uh, structurally, it's, it's related to, to, to Kegelor. Uh, it's not, not a pro drug. This is one one of the re reasons I want to give this talk because when we when we do this when when you're on Kangalore, oftentimes this will be in the setting of placing a, a fresh stent. Um, this infusion needs to be maintained before you transition to to oral um, dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, if, for instance, we lose an IV and this infusion stops. It's an emergency. It's it's as if we we didn't give any platelet inhibition in a matter of twenty minutes. Um, and Jake and I were discussing this yesterday. When we give this drug, it probably would be a really good idea to have two functioning IVs um, at all times, just in case one were to fail. Um, they could switch it to the to the other IV and keep the infusion going. Due to the way both uh, Kangalore and uh, Kangalore work, um, it can inhibit the way Plavix and Prasigrel work. So that they sort of change, because Plavix and Prasigrel bind to the acrocyte, if you're giving Kangalore to Kangalore, they, they don't function the same way. So it can sort of change the active site uh, and make them less effective. So when you are using if you're transitioning to Plavix or Prasigrel, um, oftentimes there will be this period where it's less effective as the Kangalore is uh, wearing off. And we have some protocols that people have used. Oftentimes people will do to Kangalore when they use Kangalore uh, because of this. There, there's a lot of, so this, this drug initially came out in the mid 2000s. Um, and the initial comparison was with Kangrelor to Plavix, um, which wasn't really a good comparison because they're used for, at least in my mind, they're used for completely different settings. Um, Kangrelor is used more like the um, GP2A3B Integralin type picture where you want immediate inhibition, whereas Plavix is sort of this maintenance. So comparing the two, uh, wasn't as helpful. Um, but if you, this is, there's, there's other trials going on with Kangalore right now, um, that make better comparisons. But when you compare those two, um, they basically there, it's as effective, uh, and there's no, there's no difference in, in the major bleeding. Um, there's more dyspnea with, with Kangalore. So that's one of the things that you see with P2Y12 inhibitors that people are, are short of breath. Um, doesn't have an impact on outcomes. That's just one of the, the reported uh, side effects of it. Moving past the P2Y12 inhibitors and onto this PDE inhibitor, um, Salazazole, as I said, I've seen this drug used once in the setting of using it purely for, for platelet inhibition. Um, I think it's a good drug to know about. I remember in residency, someone came in uh, for surgery and um, they had claudication and they were on salacizol and the resident didn't know that this was a platelet inhibitor so they didn't stop it uh, and then it was caught right before surgery that you know this this wasn't a good drug that they should be on right before surgery so it's it's a reversible inhibitor of the pde3 enzyme it takes about uh, onsets about three hours um, and it lasts about 12 hours as I mentioned, the primary use of this uh, is for claudication, uh, and that's because the, the one of the secondary impacts of it 
or maybe the the intended impact of it is it, is it causes vasodilation uh, in addition to inhibiting platelets. As I mentioned, people have used this as a second line inhibitor if, if someone's allergic to uh, aspirin and Plavix for, for dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, it is contraindicated for use in patients with heart failure, uh, and it's metabolized by the P450 system, um, which, much like all the other drugs, uh, eating uh, eating grapefruit or taking ketoconazole or erythromycin can have an impact on its activity. Moving on to the the drugs that we use intra-op when we're reaching for something if we need to emergently place a stent or if there's fluffy platelet plugs forming on our stents, um, the G2B3A inhibitors, the, the most common one that we use here is Integralin. Uh, Integralin's mechanism of action is uh, it, it reversibly binds to the G2B3A uh, receptor and blocks the binding of fibrinogen, von Willenbrand factor, et cetera. Um, these drugs are a little different than the other ones. They're cyclic uh, heptapeptides, and that makes sense since it's it's binding um, fibrinogen. That's what it's blocking instead of blocking ADP or thromboxane. Um, it all these drugs derive from um, snake venom. Uh, this one's from the southeastern pygmy rattlesnake. Onset's about fifteen. Minutes in 15 minutes achieves 84% of, of platelet inhibition. Duration of activity is about 2.5 hours for half life. Uh, at four hours post dosing, there's less than 50% activity of integralin remains. And this is another thing that we've focused on this year. When we have a fresh stent, if we give integralin, we need to transition to another dual antiplatelet uh, within four hours. So Plavix, for instance, if, if we did a stroke and we had to place a cardiac stent, we need to give Plavix within four hours um, because the integralin impact is going to start wearing off and it needs another uh, dual antiplatelet to, to prevent thrombosis. One thing with these drugs, uh, severe bleeding, and again, anecdotally, but the times that we've I've used this drug, uh, seem to have a, a higher rate of, of severe bleeding. Um, uh, uh, this pursuit trial, which was, um, again, a cardiac literature, severe bleeding was 4.4 um, 4 to 4.7%. Um, if you look in Lexicomp, it reports 1 to 11% of major bleeding. Again, major bleeding isn't all intracranial. It can be GI bleeding that's greater than five points and needs a transfusion. But but these are very potent inhibitors of, of platelet activity and, and can cause uh, complications from um, uh, platelet inhibition. Reapro, um, I was actually talking to Dr. Neiman about this yesterday. This is, I, I've never used Reapro. Um, it's, a, it's a reversible, uh, inhibition just like integralin, but the binding affinity is extremely high, such that you can almost view Reapro as being a permanent inhibitor. Um, it was made from IgG that targeted the receptor. Uh, onset activity was about 10 minutes. The half-life was about 10 to 30 minutes, um, which sounds good, except for, um, it binds so tightly that uh, it can remain platelet bound for 15 days and it inhibits normal aggregation beyond 48 hours. Uh, I've read some of the literature saying it's, it's, you know, seven, 10, 15 days, which as we talked about platelet turnover is, is 10 days. So um, for all intents and purposes, it, it was almost a permanent inhibitor. Um, it's no longer available in the US. Uh, I know Dr. Neiman had, had told me he had really good results with this and it was a very effective drug, um, but I think probably the complications of bleeding and the duration of activity um, limited this drug. Another one that you'll see in uh, the literature that's used with, in lieu of Integralin is Agristat. 
Um, so the mechanism of action, again, reversible binder, same as, as Integralin. Um, this is a modified version of the protein uh, found in the saw scale viper. Uh, about 10 minutes, it's got 90% platelet inhibition. Um, duration of activity is about two hours. 90% um, of, pa uh, of patients' platelet function returns to normal after 48 hours for two eight hours. So in in this situation, it'd be the same as with Integralin that we would want to start, if, if we need to do antiplatelet therapy, we'd need to start it within um, four hours. And there was no major difference in the, the adverse uh, events between Agrostat and Integralin um, in uh, their one of their trials. So after talking about all these, I wanted to dig a little deeper, and we we check PRU um, very frequently here, sometimes multiple times a day, uh, and we check ARU prior to dropping uh, a stent, an elective stent, um, to see what the activity is. So I want to talk a little bit about what they do, um, how it works, and why if you give Integralin or Agrostat or anything that targets the GP2B3A, it basically makes, it, it blocks um, the readout of this. So the ARU and PRU are based on uh, light transmission agrogometry. Simply, if you shine a flashlight through a tube and everything is mixed up, not as much light goes through. If things start to clump, more light goes through. Um, and, and that's pretty much all it does. Um, what they do is they send down um, fresh blood that we draw, and that's added to a sample that has um, fibrinogen-coated beads. And then whatever you're testing for, it adds the substrate. So for ARU, you'd add arachidonic acid. For PRU, you'd add ADP. And here, you also add another thing to block an additional receptor, um, not, not as important. But when you add those, you then give it a time period and look at how much the platelets have been activated. And when they become activated, they'll then bind to the fibrin-coated beads. And as they bind to the fibrin-coated beads, more light will be transmitted. So um, if you are not effectively inhibiting, you're going to get a very high number because the number is basically how much light is going through. Now, because the readout of this is binding to fibrinogen-coated beads, if you're blocking the receptor that fibrinogen binds to, which is what Integralin does and what Agrostat does, then it's going to block that whole cascade. So it doesn't matter. You will get um, a readout as if platelets are massively inhibited. And for instance, if you were using Reapro, this could be impacted for a very long time. So you could get a false sense of hope that you are actually doing a really good job of inhibiting platelets with Plavix when really it's just the Integralin that's inhibiting the platelets and as that falls off, you no longer will have that inhibition. Now, <laughs> one thing that Jake and I have, have debated when we when we check this multiple times a day, um, if Plavix inhibition is irreversible and we check it four hours apart, then the 10% of platelets that have turned over is is pretty minimal. What what is this change we see and, and what does it mean? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think some of it is because of the platelet turnover and because you're generating new platelets. Um, I, I think the the number that the Plavix readout that the PRU gives is plus or minus 30. So a change in 30 is not statistically significant. Um, anecdotally, when we see a Plavix, um, a PRU number that's six, um, people are at higher risk of, of bleeding, and that's why we do it. Um, before I came here, what we would use the PRU for is we would get a PRU before giving Plavix, get a PRU after a week of Plavix, and if there's 
a change and it's dropped below 194, then we would consider them a Plavix responder. If it didn't, then we would just switch to, um, to Kegrelor. So here uh, we almost use it as, a, as a, uh, an INR. Uh, and it, it seems to have a, a good um, a good marker a, in preventing uh, over inhibition or, or preventing under inhibition and, and causing um, the platelet plugs to form. But again, I, I don't know that there's a lot of experience across the country doing it like that. So maybe uh, here we're ahead of the curve and that's where it's it's going to end up. Future directions for uh, these drugs, there's a, a lot of different areas that the the antiplatelet drugs are being developed. So you can see Cangrelor here in the center. Um, there's an IV uh, formulation that's an injection instead of an infusion that's being developed. Uh, Revacept over here uh, in the GP6, that's actually in its final um, phases of its clinical trial. And then all throughout here, you can see that there, there are new drugs that are targeting uh, the PDE and the PAR 1 through 4 um, to try and see what we can get for the um, best platelet inhibition with the least amount of complications. The last part I wanted to talk about is what I think is is really the future of this, uh, and that's the the non systemic solution. So um, the stent coatings that are now being developed. So the idea for putting a coating on stent has been around for decades. Cardiac's been using it. Uh, initially, they had this thing called HepaCoat, um, which is heparin coated um, beads, or not really beads. They're they're it's a heparin coating on the um, on the stent that slowly releases heparin and stops platelets from binding to it. Down at the bottom, this sort of shows how it works. It's kind of intermixed in this biopolymer that, as the polymer breaks down, it it releases the drug. Um, we all know about drug eluding stents um, and, and their benefit in preventing restenosis. Um, and interestingly, uh, this came out and came across my my email. Um, those drug eluding stents uh, that Cardiac was using, and I've used one of these before um, intracranially, but they've developed a drug eluding stent intracranially um, and. Obviously, it's not available in the U.S., um, but they found that these the drug looning stents, it was with uh, Everolimus, um, reduced the rate of instant restenosis um, by about 20%. Uh, the ischemic stroke uh, rate at 31 to 1 year was, was less, uh, and there was no difference in the rate of stroke or death within uh, 30 days. So, drug looting stents may be something that we're using more often in the future, uh, certainly with with ICAB. The one of the bigger developments that have come out for us with flow diverting devices um, is the development of the pipeline shield device. So, flow diverters were huge for for endovascular, and now this sort of changes the game too. And this is most of what we use now. We've gotten rid of the uh, just the pipeline flex and now it's all pipeline flex with shield technology um as you know flow diverters they have a very high metal coverage compared to other stents um the high metal coverage means they're there can be more um thrombogenic so the pipeline flex has a covalent bonding of phosphorylcholine to the stent which mimics a red blood cell membrane so this isn't as if a drug is eluded it's actually covalently bonded and changes the way the stent looks to the platelet as it flows through. And that's permanent until the, the stent endothelializes. Um, does it work? This is the, the data from, from their trials. And yes, it does. It's a 94% reduction in platelet activation, 55% reduction to peak thrombin uh, compared to the non-shield uh, and decreased deployment and resheathing forces. Uh, as you can see on the left, it, it actually creates this hydrophilic coating. So the the um, little drop, little water spreads out easier. And if you look on A in the middle, uh, you can see pipeline shield in the bottom left. Um, not as much clot forms when you just flow blood uh, over this. 
Um, and then the, the electron scanning electron micrograph on D, it's probably hard to see uh, on your screens, but it's pretty cool how little um, platelet aggregation is on there compared to the pipeline device without the shield. So this, this is a very effective coding. When they look at how well this works in the human, um, what we saw was basically when you add these, if you were to get an MRI after adding a, a, a pipeline, uh, acute ischemic stroke happens in three to 6%, um, and uh, silent cerebral infarction is just marked by a, a DWI change is 50 to 90%, which, which seems very high, but um, probably is accurate in the, in the general um, population. When you use shield, um, the, the DWI hits drop to like 18%. Um, so it's, it's really good at preventing these initial uh, DWI changes. Uh, sort of the, the holy grail for us is to be able to place a stent on single antiplatelet therapy to eliminate the need for this dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, in general, people tolerate aspirin pretty well. Uh, when you add the, the dual antiplatelet, that's when you, you really start running into some issues, especially with regards to operating or, or placing an EVD. Um, it, it gets much more challenging. So <clears throat> there's a lot of trials going on looking at pipeline shield with single antiplatelet therapy. This is just one of them. Um, total of 14 patients preloaded with aspirin or loaded intraoperatively with aspirin. Six patients got intraoperative heparin. Five patients got Reapro. Obviously, this wasn't in the U.S. Um, Twelve had uh, coils in addition to the stents. There was no uh, intraop stent thrombosis. Um, one one patient had thrombosis on on day one uh, that was treated with a thrombectomy, and two others had minor thrombus develop on early post-op imaging that they were given a P2Y12 inhibitor for. Um, there was one aneurysmal rebleed. So. The results of this, I, I don't know that we're ready to jump right in and, and only treat these patients with aspirin, but people are trying and they're starting to look at whether pipeline shield can be used with single antiplatelet therapy. And, and eventually, I think that's where we'll be. Uh, to me, I think the thing that they really need to do is extend this to carotid stents as soon as they can, um, because that would be a real benefit to us in acute stroke setting. Um, if we only needed aspirin and we could stent people uh, after a, a tandem occlusion. Um, Fred X is another um, device that's in Europe. Um, very similar. They don't tell you what they binded. They bound to it. It's a proprietary nanopolymer um, that reduces the thrombogenicity. Uh, it also creates this sort of protective layer of, of water around the stent. Uh, which encourages endothelialization. Uh, and this year, actually, uh, in 2020, I think it was in February, uh, the first FredEx uh, was placed at Jefferson in Philly uh, as part of a trial. Again, this is a this is a permanent modification. It's not a, a not a drug eluding stent. Uh, another one that's over in in Europe is this P48 and uh, P64. Um, this has. Uh, a hydrophilic polymer coating on it, uh, again, covalently bound to the stent. Uh, it's it's made to mimic the glycocalyx uh, of cell membranes of the endothelial cells. And for me, I, I love the pictures here. You can see when you look at it, um, you see a significant amount of platelet binding to the stent for a bare metal stent, because all of these similar to, to pipeline, they're the same device, they just have this modification. So when you compare the two, one with coding, one without. It's really just telling you what the coding is doing because everything else is the same. Uh, and and it, it significantly reduces the amount of, of platelet adhesion. Here, when you're looking at, um, this is, this is a, a, another uh, trial about this P48, um, and they looked at um, single antiplatelet therapy. Um, seven patients were treated with with uh, the the P48 or P64 on single antiplatelet therapy. Um, they did 
uh, an ARU 30 minutes after dosing to make sure that there was adequate inhibition. Uh, six patients didn't have any thrombus. One had an MCAM2 thrombus, but there was no instant thrombosis observed. Unclear if if that was from something that got knocked off during the case or if it developed on the on the stent and um, embolized. Um, but either way, no patient required uh, additional treatment with antiplatelet medication. So here's seven patients that we were able to they were able to get away with single antiplatelet therapy. So in conclusion, looking at um, what 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 we've covered and what the future is here, um, aspirin is is the the best tolerated uh, single antiplatelet of choice. Um, Plavix is is pretty much the the first line, um, but it's very difficult to dose, uh, and it could be replaced by a reversible, easier to control medication in the near future. Um, the GP inhibitors are effective. Uh, some are very long lasting, uh, and we are part of investigating the role for using Kangrelor um, to replace some of these GP inhibitors um, in this acute setting when we when we need a uh, quick inhibition. Uh, understanding how these drugs work in their half life is is critical for the safety of our patients. Um, for integralin, for instance, we need that that second. Uh, Dual antiplatelet therapy started within four hours. If we had dropped the stent at eight o'clock and it's discovered on morning rounds that nothing was started, that person has gone hours with single antiplatelet therapy without a coating on the stent, which which could be very very bad. Um, for Kangrelor, um, knowing that if the nurse calls you and says that they lost IV access, um, this is an emergency. Uh, within twenty minutes, it's as if we haven't given anything. So it needs to be reattached and, and started again. Uh, and this was our idea of using two functioning uh, IVs at all times for these patients. Ultimately, I think the future of this uh, is using the stents that have uh, a coating on them, that we don't have to use this systemic therapy um, and covalent bonding of the, of the molecules to the stent so that there's, there's no elution or anything, it's just the stent is not recognized as easy by the platelets. Uh, if we can get that in carotid stents, that would be really beneficial. And I can't imagine that there aren't companies um, who are rapidly developing that. Um, and if we can move towards coding all of our stents, not just flow diverters, um, with using single antiplatelet therapy, uh, that'll that'll really open up our uh, ability to do, for instance, stent coiling in the setting of a rupture uh, and, and treat things more definitively endovascularly. With that, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any uh, any questions you have. Dan, that's a fabulous re and needed review. From the other standpoint, we're sitting in the ER, we have an acute and surgical life-threatening bleed on a person on one of these agents that is not the one that is reversible to monoclonal antibody. What should we do? To get the person into surgery immediately. Yeah, so um, if it's if it's aspirin, I mean the non-reversible ones are aspirin and Plavix. That's those are the the big ones that cause problems. All the G two inhibitors, um, they're short acting, and, and you wouldn't be on that. Um, <laughs> I think if it's been so, I, I know you know there's there's been. When you look at the the recent data um, for non-surgical management, it's recommended not to give platelets. If they just took their Plavix and they had a hemorrhage, giving platelets is probably not going to be very effective. Um, but if they took it three half lives ago, I certainly would give platelets mm -hmm. um, based on what I was reading, um, because you know the platelets that we give. We've all operated on on people who you gave platelets. It's it's never as good as your your platelets, but at least it's it's something. Um, so I would give I would give a, a platelet um, transfusion to them prior to going to the OR. Fair enough. Thank you. Other questions for Dan? You may have stunned them in the oh, silence. Dan, <laughs> uh, Dan uh, this is Dan. Um, uh, Brooks, um, so I have a very fundamental question. Um, uh, 
it seems that the uh, car the cardiac stents, uh, many of them, not all of them, they've and even vascular uh, stents, they've gotten to the point where they can place a stent and then they'll be on antiplatelets for a period of time and then eventually be able to come off uh, to just a baby aspirin or, or, or something uh, more manageable. Um, is that, do you know, uh, have, have an understanding of why that is in their, in their population versus our population? So we, we typically will do that. Um, for, for pure stent, um, antiplatelet or platelet inhibition. Um, usually after even the most conservative people, I would say six months ish, um, people are transitioned to single antiplatelet therapy. Some people will do it in three months, uh, after a carotid stent. So, so for us, um, that's the, the typical transition period is <clears throat> about three to six months. Sometimes people will be on dual antiplatelet for other reasons like stroke prevention um and that uh is is more the the neurologist um and us for preventing strokes but it's not just for the stent so i think we're we're moving pretty similar to what the the cardiac people do and and honestly i feel comfortable using cardiac literature because a lot of the things get ported back and forth i've used cardiac stents um in the brain and a lot of they started this whole thing before us and for some reason they are really good at churning out papers um so a lot of the literature is cardiac and and we go by also we use what their experience is in directing our antiplatelet therapy yeah well I, i'm sure it's has something to do with uh a funding and b uh that there's a lot of medical doctors not just proceduralists right taking care of those patients, which I think makes a big difference. Um, is there, but I guess my, 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 uh, is there something having to do with the size in the brain? So, so you're saying even in, 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 uh, intracranial stents, you're, there's, there's a potential to come off of dual platelet therapy. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, patients. Oh. I haven't seen what, what okay. David and, and Ozem and Bev do. Um, we haven't placed a lot of stents, but it's probably in the neighborhood of six months. Um, what they they can come off of of the plavix or whatever the second line is usually you stay on aspirin for life whenever we place a stent and and sorry uh the flow diverters so the, the similar those types of stents yep similar three to six months Jake. okay six yeah all right thanks cool. very much well, great great talk yep and yeah, thank you dan thank, thank you very you. much well done hey dan's josh meadow great talk Thank you.